Good morning, and thanks for being with us. And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn with me over in your Bibles, um, over to John. Um, John chapter 5 is where we're going to spend some time. Now, I have to tell you, we're going to be looking at the third sign. Um, we uh, shifted gears in our miracle series. We are in a series. If you're new with us this weekend, or been a while since you've been here, be with us. Um, we're in a miracle series. We've been in it now for uh, several weeks. I guess this is week number six of the series, and we're actually going to finish out the year in this series um, entitled Miracles. And we shifted gears last weekend and started looking at, over in John, John gives us an account of seven signs that actually give confirmation to Jesus being the Messiah, the Son of God. And uh, we are actually walking through the month of November through those seven signs. Um, the first sign uh, uh, showed us that Jesus can, be, can, can and will transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. Now, a reminder, we talked about the first two signs last weekend. So we talked about how Jesus takes the ordinary and can transform it into the extraordinary. Then we shared and talked about uh, last weekend the second sign that showed us that Jesus is also Lord over time and space. And we looked at uh, the various aspects of Jesus' life and, um, and, and, and two miracles that took place um, uh, that actually demonstrated those two signs. Tonight, or later on this evening or this afternoon, whatever you want in your time frame, um, we'll, I will release our weekend thoughts. And actually, I'm going to talk about the fourth sign um, through the weekend thoughts. Okay? So y'all track with me how this is going to work, how we're going to get through in November with seven signs. Um, so tonight, uh, just go to centralchristianeden.com, um, and it'll be posted right there. Or if you're following us on, on our, any of our social media, it'll be there for you uh, to actually watch you know, as I talk about the fourth sign. But we need to talk about the third sign. And the third sign is that Jesus comes to bring hope to the hopeless. Jesus comes to bring hope to the hopeless. Now, I want to show up there. Uh, oh, you go ahead. There it is. Um, how many of you are familiar with a balloon? You know, there's multiple things you can do with a balloon. Anybody ever been in a hot air balloon? Mm -hmm. No? I've always wanted to go up in a hot air balloon. Okay. Um, one has been in a hot air balloon. I've always wanted to go in a hot air balloon. Um, in, in different places across uh, the United States. I know that they do these things, festivals, with hot air balloons, and it's really neat to see them lined up. Anybody ever seen anything like that? At least seen them? Yeah. Um, anybody ever participated in a water balloon fight? Anybody? <laughs> water balloon fight? I, I thought about having a bucket full of water balloons up here this morning, and I thought, well, no, maybe not. But I, 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 my mind did go that direction. For just a but you know, I, I don't know if you realize this, but Actually, the, the balloon is a symbol of hope. How many of you are aware of that? Um, the balloon is a symbol of hope. And so often in our lives, just, let, let me just ask, have you ever felt hopeless? Have you ever felt like, uh, uh, you know, like there was just, well, you just felt hopeless? Whatever that time was in your life, or maybe it's right now, I want you to hold on to that for just a second. I want you to hold on to the feelings of that. I want you to put yourself, just for a few minutes before we go to what John shares with us this weekend, I, I want you just to try to, I know you maybe, maybe think I don't want to, but I want you, um, and maybe it's real easy because maybe that's where you're at right now. Maybe you feel like you're in a hopeless situation. There's just no way out. There's just, you know, there's, there's no answers. You know, I want you to tap into that. It's really important that we tap into that this weekend to understand this third sign. That Jesus comes to bring hope to the hopeless. Over in John chapter 5, again in verse 1, John shares a time to us in the life of Jesus. And we're going to see how Jesus brings hope. To this individual. Look with me. It says over in John chapter 5. It says that now again. We want to put ourselves in this place. To really understand what's going on. We need to uh, you know, just try to put our minds. Try to put our being. Try to put ourselves at this place. It says at these things there was a feast of the Jews. 
And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So where is Jesus going up to? He's going up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, which in Hebrew is called Bethsaida, having five porticles. In those porticos lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, limping, or paralyzed. So Jesus is going up, and at the sheep gate, in other words, at the gate, entering into the city, city at this place, you have those that would say that are feeling hopeless. They're, they're there at, at this place uh, of porticos, and, and they're, they're sick, they're blind, they're, they're limping, they're, they're laying, they're paralyzed. All these different illnesses are all around. Now, it goes on to say, now a man was there who had been ill for 38 years. 38 years. Jesus, upon seeing this man lying there and knowing that he had already been in the condition for a long time, said to him, do you want to get well? Now, underline that or highlight that, or maybe for some of you, uh, because of uh, your involvement in church, maybe you've heard a sermon or a lesson or maybe in a, a small group stay or something, so you already got to highlight it. Highlight it again. Do you want to get well? Now, here's what's going on. John is revealing to us. John is sharing with us that Jesus is having a discussion. Now, notice all these six individuals are around. Those that are paralyzed. Those with different ailments are all around this portico. Porticos are, are all around this sheep gate. I was almost about to fall there, and then I would have been hard for the That would have been funny if I ended up right in there. That'd be neat to be online. You know? Jesus is all these people around, and Jesus has noticed this man, and he's having this dialogue with this man. He's having this discussion among the sick, the blind, and the paralyzed. But now we don't know exactly um, to the extent, we know how long, we know for 38 years he had this illness. But we're not sure exactly what's going on. But he's lying there beside this pool. And during this conversation, Jesus asked him what a lot would look at and say, well, that's a really inter interesting question. Do you want to get well? Now, coming through a pandemic with COVID and those that uh, have been experiencing COVID and, and, um, and, and, and or you have maybe have, uh, have been, had been sick with COVID or you've had family or friends or different interests, the interesting question said, when they have COVID, do you want to get well? You want to get well, so it, it, when you we hear these words, it, it it kind of plays with our minds a little bit. It says, "Well, why in the world would Jesus ask? You know, you 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 maybe you're, the flu or different stuff like that, or you've been sick, or maybe you're sick now, or maybe you know you have someone walk up and say, say, well, do you want to get well? You ever had your doctor say, would, would you like to get well? Do you really want to get well?'" Why would Jesus ask a man that's been ill, he's been sick, apparently he's not able to walk, and why, would, why, why would he ask him, do you want to get well? Well, at first glance, when we first, it, it kind of says, well, what's going on here? Why would he, you know, and notice Jesus, uh, you know, I, I kind of, you know, it, Notice there's other people around. There's other people that are sick. There's other people, you know, and I can only envision maybe, you know, and if you allow me just to kind of uh, fill in the blanks a little bit, all the people around, and there's this dialogue between Jesus and this man, and as he asks this man, do you want to get well? I can imagine all, some of the other individuals chiming in and go, well, I'll get well. I'd like to get well. I'd like to get Yeah, I would. if you don't want to get well, I'd like to get well. When we dig a little deeper into this question, though, we see that it is the perfect question to ask. And really, it's a question that this weekend, whether it be online or here in person, that 
is being asked to us, and we really have to deal with the question. So let me ask you, do you want to get wet? You know, because how long has, how long, you, you tell me, how long has this man been in this, how long has he been living in this specific life? 38 years. 38 years is a long time to be in a situation. 38 years is, although in a, in a, hope, a hopeless situation, that's a long time. To, to be dealing, maybe even in your own life, maybe there's been things that you, you think through, or maybe that thing when I said I want you to hold on to that feeling of hopelessness, that, or maybe it's even now, but that thing, you know, maybe you've been dealing with that specific thing, or maybe you've been feeling hopeless for years. So what does it do? It becomes a very part of who we are. You know, we, 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 we just know that's the way we do life. We get in a routine. You know, I would dare say that this man probably 38 years this, he sort of got in a routine. Well, I'll go down to the pool or get down to the pool. Or maybe that's where he stayed all the time, was right there at the pool. He just did, you know, the various people that were around. Probably they got to know one another, develop relationships with one another. All these various things that took place. It just became part of his very life, the very part of who he is. Very much the same with us. Whatever we're carrying, whatever baggage, whatever mask we have, it just becomes the very part of who we are. So as we talk, as we look at God's Word, as we talk about our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, it's very hard for us to understand because the, the, the way we are, or the, or the scars, or whatever we carry with us, it's who we are. That's not who we are. So often in our society today, in our culture... We try to brand and say, okay, this is, this is who we are. This is who we are as a group of people. This is, and, and instead of really looking at individuals, y'all tracking with me for this? Or am I just kind of just throwing it out there? See where we're going with this? So it's a question that every one of us have to wrestle with. Do we want to get well? Do we really want to get well? Look what John shares with us in verse 7 through 9. It says, the sick man answered him. Now, I want you to underline that, circle that, or highlight that part. It says, the sick man answered him. Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another step down before me. Jesus said to him. Now let me just stop right there. Think about that for me. Let those words. Let me read those two again. He says, this is his answer. He says, sir, I have no man to put me. Now, what is the question that Jesus asked? Jesus asked the man, do you want to get well? And how does he respond? Or very important for us to understand this. He responds by saying, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, but, I, but while I'm coming, another one steps down before me. You hear his answer? Let me read on. It says, Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately the man became well, and he picked up his pallet and began to do what? Y'all tell me, what did he do? Wow. He walked. Is there any hesitation? No. no. Uh, let me think about it. <laughs> he picks up his pallet and he walks. Did you notice, though, and if you will, the answer, but not an answer that the man answers to Jesus? Do you want to get well? What does he do? And in big letters, if you're taking notes or in your Bible or whatever, I want you to write excuses. Excuses. He starts to give excuses. When Jesus says, do you want to get well? Instead of saying, yes, I want to get well. Yes, I have such a desire. Yes, I'm so sick and tired of this life. Yes, I want this relief. Yes, I want to be healed. Yes, I want to get well. He goes into these things of excuses. 
He goes in and says, well, I have no one to put me into the pool. And, and every time I try to get into the pool, then someone steps in front of me. It's kind of like saying, it's kind of like saying to ourselves, people will make excuses that they will say, well, um, you know, everybody's got this, out. everybody's just out to get me. Or if I could, you know, nobody wants to help. If I could just get a break. You know, when, when life, when, when, when I get to a certain point in my life, then that's when. When I have, uh, when I'm going to reach a certain point financially, when I've reached a certain point of stability, when I've done this or that. We can, even, we can do it from an organizational standpoint, from a business standpoint, from a family standpoint, or even from a church standpoint. We can say, well, when we get to this certain size, then we'll do this. When we get this certain amount of money, then we can do this. When we have this, when we have this group of volunteers, then we can do this. We become a society. We become an or a society. We become a culture. We become individuals. We become our lives. No excuses. Anybody know anybody like that? Now don't look to your left or your right. <laughs> don't stand up and look behind. Oh. See, we see that this man, what does he decide to do? If you allow me just to indulge a little bit in this, what does he decide to do? Uh, if you allow me to do a little bit on that one, he just kind of throws a pity patty party. He kind of, you know, the, the song Going to Garden Eating Worms. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me going to garden. Anybody know that song? No? Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Where are you going? I'm going to go and eat worms. Or I was brought up in that. It's kind of like someone's got some stinking thinking. That's exactly where it's at. And, and, and really, you know, when you look at it, you know, you know this guy, you know, he, when, he's been this way for 38 years. You know, he's, he's there. He says, you know, well, you know, he has some legitimacy behind this. No one's there to help him. You would think someone, you would think that they're all there together and we're trying to help one another. But yet, what, what are they doing? They're thinking to themselves. And so people, what does he say? People are cutting in front of him and all these different things. So when you really look at it, for a lot of us, we'll justify and say, well, really, let's don't be too hard on the dude. You know, I mean, really, he's got a lot of legitimacy there. I want this to notice what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't answer him and say, you know what? You're right. I am so sorry that they're selfish. I'm so sorry that you're going through this. I'm so sorry for you that. You notice Jesus doesn't say that. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, take up your power and walk. In other words, stop with the excuses. Now I realize, here's Jesus experiencing this, you know, this miracle that this man is performing, that is, that is he that he is experiencing. But he says, get up. Pick up your power. And walk. And we see that immediately the man became well. And he picked up his power. And began to walk. He begins walking. Again, we're there. What would our reaction be around that? What do you think the other, those that were there that were still at the pool, that were sick, that were paralyzed, what do you think their reaction would be?
he had to get up. What if he would have said, nope, not happening. <laughs> Don't you understand? I've been here 38 years. I just told you no one will help me. You know, what if the man would have said, if you, can you help me get up? Can I have your shoulder to lean on? What does he do? He gets up. Not only does he get up and walk, but let's don't lose fact that actually through, through this miracle, not only is the miracle that he gets up and walk, but do you notice he's actually able not only to get up and walk, but he's actually to carry something with him. Now, what did he say? He said, no one will help me. No one will carry me into the pool. You notice this man? He gets up. He carries his pallet with him. Well, let me stop right there. He carries his pallet. You notice he doesn't carry anybody else to the pool? He's throwing it out there. I'll let that so. He doesn't carry anyone else. But I want you to notice what death transpired, what takes place, what John shares with us. It says, so the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath. And it's not permissible for you to carry. I'm sorry, I have to chuckle. It's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them. He who made me well was the man who said, pick it up and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said, who said to you, pick it up and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who he was. For Jesus had slipped away while, they were, while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. Now, I'll get back to that, but I want you to notice, what has transpired? we we got to understand the whole trans... We, there's so much here. As, as I study this, and as I dive into this more, and as I'm even preaching on run, there's even... there's so Man, we can make a whole series out of this. There's so much there, because what happens? Here we have this man. He's walking around with his pallet. He's been healed, and, we're, and we've already, already acknowledged that he doesn't start putting people into the pool. He doesn't start bringing people and people to Jesus. He doesn't do any of that. What does he do? We find him in the temple. Not that being in a place of worship was wrong. But we're already, already acknowledging instead of going and getting people and bringing them to Jesus because Jesus is the one that heals him. All these things, and I know they said that Jesus slipped away, and I understand all that, but do we have the gravity and understanding of exactly all this where John is sharing with us that is so much there? Not that we shouldn't be in a place of worship, not that we shouldn't be together, but sometimes we're so wrapped up in the place of worship that we're not actually out bringing people and sharing Jesus with people. Because we've been healed. Because we were once hopeless, but now we have hope. After Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you've become well. That's what he says to him. Do not sin anymore. Don't sin anymore. So that nothing worse, underline this part, I highlight it, says, so that nothing worse happens to you. It says that the man went away and informed the Jews. That it was Jesus who made me him well. It was Jesus that made him well. For this reason the Jews were persecuting. Who? What did he do? But they're persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things. Why? Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. He was doing these things. 
days on the Sabbath. But he answered them. He says, my father is, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. Yes, Jesus heals this man on the Sabbath. Yes, the man's carrying his power on the Sabbath. Don't lose. What is actually transpired? Do, you, do we really get the gravity? Do we really have an understanding of what all is transpired? This man, this dude, for 38 years couldn't walk. He now can walk. Who cares it's the Sabbath? <laughs> really? Jesus healed this man. His life is forever changed. And they are so caught up in the rules and all this. They're so caught up in that part. They're so caught up in the whole idea of the Sabbath. They're so caught up in all this that they lose sight. The religious leaders are outraged because this man is carrying his power. I, I, I have to, uh, I just, maybe it's my, my way my mind works, but I can't help but laugh at that. This man standing before them holding his power. And he couldn't walk. And they're upset. They want him to put his power down instead of celebrating in his miracle. They're so concerned about these rules and regulation and the laws that they're missing life change. They've gotten so caught up in the details that they miss Jesus. They've gotten so caught up in the details that they miss Jesus and they miss the miracle. So Jesus finds this man in the temple and he tells him to do what? He tells him not to sin anymore. He goes on to say, so, so something worse will happen to you. So don't sin. Go and sin no more. Now, what do we do with all this? We've already talked about various things and uh, as we break down this time that John shares with us. But just some things I want to encourage you to jot down that we can, as we start to uh, chew over this and mull over this and think through this, uh, just some, how do we apply it? It's clear from the story that John shares with us that, that Jesus gave this man clear instruction on what to do and what not to do. Clear instruction. You can write this down. What does he tell him to do? He says, get up, pick up your pallet, and do what? Walk. Walk. What does he tell him not to do? Sin no more. What? Sin. Don't sin no more. Get up, stand up, take your pallet, and walk. Don't sin no more. <coughs> You know, Jesus is acknowledging the sin in this man's life. He's saying, don't sin no more. He said, well, he said you know, he says, you think maybe, I, I, know, I, I know what's been going on. Don't sin no more. Don't forget this time. Don't forget. In other words, don't forget how your life's been changed. Don't forget where you were at. Don't forget what's going on. So, write this question down. This is part of our Africa How Do We Play. Let's write this question down. What is Jesus asking you to do? What is Jesus asking you to do? What is Jesus asking us to do? What is Jesus asking we can apply to us as a church? What is Jesus asking us to do as a church? What is he asking us to do individually? What is Jesus asking you to do? Maybe right now you don't can't fill in that blank. Maybe you can. 
Maybe you've been wrestling with God over something, or maybe you know some sitting so, you know, you know, and I, yeah, that sounds good, or no, and I'm gonna go this way, you know, you know, this sort of things like that. Maybe you can fill in, or maybe you can't. And there's that's that, that, that's something to introduce into your prayer life. Say, okay, Jesus, what what do I do? What do you want me to do? As I invite you more into my life on a day-to-day -day perspective, as I invite you, Lord, into my inner circle, my, my circle of influence, as I invite you into my home, as I invite you into my place of work, as I invite you into my life, what do you want me to do? And then behind that, there's another question. Is there something that Jesus is asking you to stop? Let me write that down. Is there something that Jesus is asking you to stop? Is there something you know that you need to leave behind? Is there something you know that you need to, you know, when we are in a hopeless state, when we get to that point, what is it? There? There's things that we hold on to, is there not? There's things that we, 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 we just, they become our, 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 our blanket, if you are, our, our, our blanket of security. Anybody, when you're growing up as a child, or maybe your children, or maybe even your grandchildren, you had, they have this security blanket, anybody? Yeah. I, I, I think it was Meredith that had used to, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure I'll get corrected later. If I'm not, but I think I'm right. It was Meredith that had a green frog blanket. <laughs> And that went everywhere until we were traveling on vacation and it got lost. And it was catastrophic when it got lost. <laughs> so much so that there's some things that in, in our older daughter's life, in Mary's life, that we sometimes can actually go back to that point. See, some of us are holding on to things so much and their security, what it is, that maybe you, whatever happened is you can go back to that point if that's your security. And maybe if that security is removed or maybe it's been removed, you don't know where, ever, where to go. So it is really, there's, there's other scars that's there. Y'all trying to call me on that? What is it that Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, you know what? It, Forget the pool of water. You need to take up your pallet and you need to walk. Forget the excuses. Forget. Stop relying on other people and all. You need to get up and you need to walk. What is it that Jesus is asking us to stop? That we've rallied around as our security blanket that we hold on to. And it could be in numerous things. We could write a whole list. I have my marker board up here this morning. We could write it on a lot of them down. There's one last thought I want to leave with you as we get ready to close. All right, I share with you at the beginning that the balloon is a, a symbol of hope. Um, uh, one last picture, and if you'll put it up, okay. Anybody familiar with this picture? It's a world famous picture. It's, it's, it was created, I can't pronounce the artist's name, so I'm not even going to try. Um, there's some questions about who this artist, I believe, really is. We know it, it, it's a British, a British artist. But the reason I, I want to draw you to this is it with a, it's with a girl with a, a balloon, but it's in the shape of a heart. Now, notice about a balloon. There's interesting things. A balloon, if you hold on to it, there's only so much you can do out of a balloon, right? If you have a water balloon, if I have a water balloon up here right now, well, it's just a balloon with water, right? Not any fun at all, is it? If I throw that water balloon, it's fine. If I launch that water balloon out into the crowd, man, that would be a blast. You know, a hot air balloon, it could be sitting on the ground. Some of you have said, you know, I haven't actually been in one and flown in one, but actually, you know, a lot of them, raise your hand, that have been to festivals that have seemed lit up. They're beautiful, they're pretty and all that, but 
especially for the person that's in the hot air balloon, what do they want to do? They want to fly. You carry around your balloon all around and all that and hold on to it, but eventually it flies. Well, the whole idea around this picture is, 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 is it's a, if you will, a painting of a, a child holding a balloon, this, a balloon, a heart. <coughs> And she's reaching out for her balloon. Now here's the thing. She's reaching out for her law-shaped balloon. But the question is, what's the message behind all this? What's the message behind the painting? Some believe that the heart refers to love, hope, and innocence. Youthfulness and self-assurance. But here's the thing. It's not clear that the artwork is meant to show loss of hope. Or that the desire, get this, or that the desire of hope is out of reach. But here's the thing. I'm not so naive not to believe that there are those in our audience this weekend, whether it be online or in person, that can't relate to that picture. That you think that hope is actually out of reach. That our society, that our culture, maybe in our country, is at the point that it looks and is trying to hold on to a heart balloon that thinks that hope is out of reach. See, with Jesus, and here's the thing, with Jesus, hope is never out of reach. For in Jesus, there is hope. Let me say that again. For with Jesus, hope is never out of reach. Because with Jesus, and in Jesus, I'm going to pray and over the next few moments we're going to take part in communion whether it be online wherever you're at watching or here in person and y'all have the little cups and we're going to pray and take part in that and then for the rest of the service I'm going to be right down here in front I will pray with you I'll talk to you about what it means to have this relationship with Jesus to experience this hope, hope even in a world where it seems to be so hopeless to actually start to experience hope now let me say this it doesn't mean that we don't have struggles it doesn't mean that maybe and God forbid but maybe you maybe you have a doctor's appointment this week or maybe even tomorrow it doesn't mean that you're not going to maybe hear that news from the doctor it doesn't mean that 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 these things, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be hunky dory and everything's going to be fine. You're going to have this ooey gooey feeling inside that everything's just going to feel it. That's not what that means. But through a relationship with Jesus, it is a life, a hope, a joy that transcends. Anything you possibly can imagine or experience. You see, let me just say this as we take part of communion. Jesus didn't just die on a cross and rise from the dead to get you into heaven. Although that's a gift and that's part of it. Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead for you right now. You understand? For you right now, we share the gospel, you know. And hey, here's the thing about that balloon and hope and all those things about that. You know, what happens when we allow hope, when we allow this relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and we allow Jesus to breathe life into us, we can hold it on. You know, what happens a lot of times? Let me just say, what happens a lot of times? What, what, what does it do? You know, we, we kind of take this hope and all that. We experience hope. 
and all this, and we experience joy, and we just sit there. Come Thanksgiving Day, we sit there. We sit there. We sit there. Oh, life is good. <laughs> we're like that with hope. We're like, we're like that with joy. We're like that with Jesus. You know, life is good. I am bound for my hope lies in eternity. I am bound, so I hold it all in. What happens? Where do we have fun with the bloom when we what? When we let go. Where do we really get in the midst of really enjoying in this experience? When we take Jesus, we're experiencing the hope, we're experiencing life, and we're doing life. And what do we do? We let go. We share Jesus with others. We watch others experience that hope. We watch others experience that joy. We watch others. Take part in the hope 